I'm Peg Breen, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. This is the third program in a month long series celebrating our 11th Sacred Sites Open House. This year's theme is With You in Spirit. It's a nod to the fact that we are doing our second virtual open house, uh, courtesy of COVID-19. The good news is that being virtual, many more people uh, can come to this program and hear Jeff Green and Emily Sotilli from Evergreen Architectural Arts. Jeff, in fact, is joining us all the way from Italy. Evergreen is a premier restoration and conservation firm. They've worked on all types of significant buildings, including numerous religious institutions, and they've always been great supporters of Open House. Today, we're going to look at an award-winning restoration of an historic synagogue, and we're gonna learn how to read sacred architecture. We're gonna do that first with uh, Jeff introducing a video on their award-winning restoration of the Elder Street Synagogue, and then Emily, will show us on a video how to read art and architecture, and then we'll answer all your questions. So if you have questions as this goes along, please put them in the chat and we're happy to get to them. So now uh, let's take it away and let's see Jeff's restoration. Thank you for inviting me to this series with you in spirit from the New York Landmarks Conservancy. I wanna talk about the Elder Street Synagogue, a project that I've worked on is very dear to my heart. Uh, we started in the mid eighties. It was essentially an abandoned building with homeless people living in it and a, barely a minion meeting only in the basement. And we went in through the basement, met the people there and then we went upstairs. And when I entered the sanctuary, I got goosebumps. It was something extraordinary even it was in this wrecked and dilapidated state, uh, there was an incredible sense of presence. And I wasn't the only person who felt this. It was, it was everybody who went there felt there was uh, something deposited in this sacred space. You know, maybe the prayers of thousands of immigrants or uh, whatever had happened in this space, but somehow the physical space had been transformed into something that everyone sensed was important and in a certain way, sacred. Um, so we started in the mid eighties. Uh, we did a paint study, a paint and a finishes analysis. This is the condition that things were in. This, and were overpainted, the plaster was rotten. Um, and we did our forensic research. We determined what the original patterns were and how the uh, uh, synagogue had evolved in its decorative campaigns over a period of time. And we created the document in 1986. And subsequent, after that, the building continued to deteriorate. They finally, slowly, 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 over 20 years, um, started the renovation. And then our document was some of the only things that were left about what actually existed. So, so, so much of it had been destroyed. Um, so these are just the given conditions. Uh, and again, it was incredibly evocative, even in this dilapidated state. Um, and I might add that uh, it's a family lore that uh, very possibly when my grandfather came to this country in uh, 1906 and landed at Ellis Island, this is very likely where he would have gone to Shul before uh, go, moving from New York to Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where I, my father was born and I was born. Um, but so there's a, a, a family connection here as well. And I think that adds to this sort of emotional connection one has to the space. So we did the paint analysis, these are all the before pictures. Ultimately, we built a uh, large floating scaffolding so we could get to the ceiling. And the idea was to preserve as much of the original as possible without taking too much of the patina off. So in that regard, it was a very unusual project um, uh, over this long period of time. And then we came back in 2006, uh, to do the actual restoration. Um, here we are with our exposure windows of the overpainted dome ceilings. So you can see all the different layers and all the different campaigns. And even though some of the campaigns were just the same patterns repeated, uh, they had shifted a little bit. So uh, we had to document everything as to uh, what it was. And, and as I said, part of the unusual thing was we could replicate the finishes, but they chose instead to 
preserve and remove the overpaint, which is highly unusual. We've only done it a couple of times where they've gone to that extreme to reveal the original with all its patina and the handwork of the original artisans. So on the right here, we're removing the overpaint to reveal the original. And then on the left is what, what we were able to save. And then we had to infill it. So here's a, uh, an area where we removed all the overpaint. And these are the conditions that we had. And so on the left, you can see the peeling paint. What we did is we went back with little tacking irons. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And reattached every little flake of loose paint. And in the photograph on the right, you can see where we've cleaned the lower sections, how much lighter they were. That's just the soot being cleaned off and stabilizing the paint. And here's some of the, we went back with hypodermic needles and. Uh, injected the plaster to consolidate it. The idea was to preserve as much of the original as possible and preserve the ambiance of the place, uh, which was quite an undertaking. Uh, here we are cleaning on the left, and then that here we are putting consolidate on, laying back down the loose paint, which was like cornflakes, so that we could preserve every little flake of paint. Uh, and then here we are, this is cleaned and uncleaned, and uh, here we are in painting, just little spots of paint to, to blend the, uh, the damage in with the original. Of course, we had to repair the plaster, three coat plaster on wood lath, um, where there were uh, plaster ornaments. We had to take molds and uh, cast new, new pieces and then install those. Here we are making molds and, and putting, filling cracks and installing the new pieces. Um, so we have a strong foundation to work on. And then we, we cleaned off, we found all the original marbleizing. We were able to take off layers and layers of varnish and overpaint and reveal the originals of the whole exercise was just to preserve what was original. Um, here we are in painting the sections that we removed the overpaint and now we're infilling the adjacent sections. Um, Regilding the stars on the ceiling on the original backgrounds. And we also restored the, there were two murals uh, in the, uh, on the Bema wall uh, with the curtain showing the, uh, the Holy of Holies behind the curtain. Uh, these were also restored in the wood grain. Um, all of this wood that you see uh, was painted to look like oak. It was pine painted to look like oak. So it was an extensive wood graining everywhere, all the wainscots, all the balcony fascia, it was all wood grained. And we put all that back originally as well. Um, and then on the Bima itself, uh, we restored one of the tablets uh, and we left the other one uh, in its original state so that everyone could see how, what the transformation was. Um, and we cleaned all the wood, removed the shellac and the finishes, renewed those finishes. And here's what it looked like um, essentially when we finished with the chandeliers put back. And uh, so I think we succeeded in maintaining the quality of sense of place that was there while reorganizing it. And there are pieces that are left of the you know, exposed plaster. So one can see the, what, what it looked like, but it's intact now. It's not a, a disrupted impression. And uh, after this after this photograph was taken, they ultimately went back and Kiki uh, Smith redesigned the um, uh, circular rosette window. The four uh, lights that you see in this photograph, the original uh, round, window was blown out in a tornado in 1939. And then they used it as an opportunity to put back a, a new artistic statement. And so the building continues to evolve, continues to be used by the community, uh, but in new ways as a museum and as a teaching place for, um, that's open to the public now. So that not only for the uh, families of the immigrants who worshiped here, but now really as the neighborhood has completely changed. Uh, it still becomes a vital uh, element in the community and uh, something that everyone can enjoy and learn from. And it, it's a, just a fabulous institution, the uh, museum at Eldridge Street. So there's a 
quick. Here's some, we'll go back and show you what it looked like beforehand. Uh, and then on the right, uh, there it is afterwards, just to remind you of before and after. Um, it's really quite the transformation. And this is what it looks like now with the new Kiki Smith uh, rosette window. And if you have any questions, please let me know. And uh, I'm glad to participate in the sacred space. I think it's important that uh, our sacred architecture is preserved and uh, is there for future generations. Uh, these sort of living buildings, uh, they tell a story of the past, but they have a place to play in the present as well. Thank you. Hello, welcome to With You in Spirit, Reading Sacred Architecture, a part of the New York Landmarks Conservancy's 2021 Sacred Sites program. I'm Emily Sotilli, director of the Sacred Space Studio at Evergreen Architectural Arts. As you may know, Evergreen works in all different kinds of buildings, uh, state capitals and theaters, uh, iconic commercial buildings. Um, I'm really privileged to get to work specifically in all of our religious projects. Um, and it's always a, a treat to collaborate with the New York Landmarks Conservancy in their effort to really highlight how these buildings um, of all denominations and faiths really impact our built environment, our communities, and, and all of us. So I was meditating on this very rich topic of um, with you in spirit for this year's um, program. And, um, you know, this is an ancient idea. It shows up in St. Paul's letters to the communities that he's separated from geographically, that he can't be with them in person, but that he is with them in spirit. And so while this is this, this ancient idea um, that shows up throughout the ages, I think it's really given new life in this era of the coronavirus pandemic. I think that we'd be hard pressed to find anyone in 2020, 2021, who hasn't at some point said to loved ones um, that we couldn't be with them in person for marriages, births, birthdays, um, deaths, and other significant life events, but that we're with them in spirit. While I was preparing for this, I was also reading um, Victor Hugo's great work, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and he writes a really incredible thing about architecture. Architecture was, down to the 15th century, the chief register of humanity. That in that interval, not a thought which is in any degree complicated made its appearance in the world which has not been worked into an edifice. That every popular idea and every religious law has had its monumental record. That the human race has, in short, had no important thought which it has not written in stone. So that really begs the question then, um, when we encounter any buildings, but especially sacred sites, um, what they have to say about this idea of being present in spirit when we can't be present in, in person. So the first example I think that we can think of uh, at this time in particular is of those that we can't be with because we are separated with them through death. Um, so specific people who have died and can be named. And the great example, of course, is of a, at a cemetery and the individual grave markers, the monuments to each soul um, laid to rest there. And so this is the cemetery at Trinity Episcopal Church on Wall Street and really just steps from this teeming, vibrant street full of life and um, commuters and residents and tourists is this vanitas, this reminder that all life is temporal and passing. And I love what uh, Duncan Stroik said about this, every life is eternal. How can we bring that out in a material way? And the monument, the grave marker, is a great example of that. So, you know, emblazoning a, a durable, long-lasting surface like stone with a name that invites us to read it and participate with it. It's a memory. So, you know, for those of us who knew, some, knew the departed, we may go to um, spend time to at the graveyard to um, bring flowers, to tend to the grave marker, to pray there for the departed, um, and maybe even have a conversation 
um, for those who didn't know or have a personal connection with the departed um, who may be just walking through the graveyard, they may also interact. They're also invited to read aloud or even in their heads, but often to say, well, who are you? Um, and piece together these clues of someone hitherto unknown. So the years that they died, the symbols on the markers, the names of those of the markers that surround a gravestone. And so it is really an, an interactive way to be with someone who we cannot be with in, in person. This is uh, Kelly Caldwell, um, who heads our conservation team, uh, restoring one of the grave markers at Trinity Episcopal Church earlier this year. And then that connection in spirit, not just to one particular person, but to many of those who came long before us and who will come long after us. So it's another, those people with whom we're separated by time and I think a great example of this is the Eldridge Street Synagogue. And um, Jeff Green spoke um, beautifully about um, the intricacies of the restoration of this project and his personal connection to it. Um, I, uh, I really feel connected to this, this building as well. This was the first um, project that I visited when I joined um, this, the, the sort of restoration project on, um, in the works that I visited um, when I joined Evergreen in 2007. And you know, one of the things that really strikes me um, whenever I'm in this building is how it is just covered and dusted with stars. Um, you know, in the side aisles, in this with this this, this dome uh, um, above, with the um, the beautiful window. And it always reminds me of God's promise to Abraham: "I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky." And so to think about that promise at the very beginning of the Jewish tradition and religion and how it transports us to this moment in the Lower East Side um, where so many people came through Ellis Island and into the Lower East Side and then on to populate the, the all of the United States and you know when we're standing there also those who will in the future have will pray at Eldred Street and the synagogue and who will visit the museum. And so that continuity with the past and future expressed through the artwork and decoration of the building. And of course, this is the, um, the work in progress from the before the restoration and after. And of course, um, you know, the concept of being present with Jesus, um, one of the most, I think, complex, uh, one of the many complex mysteries in Christianity is expressed in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is recorded as saying, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. Um, and I think that this is beautifully expressed at the United Methodist Christ Church on Park Avenue. So this is the apse. Um, mosaic um, featuring Christ Pentecrator who looks over all who come to worship on Sundays as well as all who come throughout the day to pray and meditate and sit quietly in his presence. And I can attest, um, as uh, having just participated in the restoration of this of this building, that um, you know the doors are open um, at Christ Church all day, and people really do come in and spend time there. Um, and I think that um, you know this is a really powerful way to represent that sort of foundational mystery of Christianity. And um, here's an example just of um, of the work of restoring the mosaics. Um, and this is sort of in the early stages of, of the restoration. Um, you can see um, these little, in, in, the, in the center, um, where these little squares that have been cleaned and restored. And um, of course now the, um, the whole ceiling, all, all the mosaics and uh, it are just um, glittering. And, um, and so if you have the opportunity to, to come in, um, I hope that you will. And uh, we started with uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and we'll end there too with the ringing of bells. And um, so this is really um, about 
how the architecture expresses um, how to be present with those who we are separated from geographically. Um, the ringing of bells um, certainly is an auditory call to prayer, um, but even the towers, the bell towers, signal that to us, even when we don't hear the bells ringing. And so, you know, um, we know bells ringing at the time of, of mass and services, um, uh, ringing you know, for alarm um, and uh, um, for joyous occasions, weddings, um, for, you know, for funerals. Um, but we, we also, um, the, the Angelus, which is rung in Catholic churches three times a day. Um, but the, this tradition really begins in the monastic setting where um, the Liturgy of the Hours or the Divine Office prayed throughout the day by the religious community who are w living in the, under the rule of, of um, St. Benedict um, with the imperative to work and pray and who gather throughout the day um, in their communities to pray together. And so even though these communities are separated from the world, they're cloistered from them, they are gathering together at the time of these bell ringing and are united both with each other, but also with the church universal and all those who are across the world and separated from them, reading the same scriptural passages and psalms and hymns at the various times throughout the day. And so, you know, this is a two cathedrals in New York, um, St. Joseph's in Brooklyn and St. Patrick's in um, Manhattan, two different styles of architecture. Um, but those bell towers, even when we don't hear the ringing of the bells and we see them, really should be that visual cue about that unity um, of the community that gathers to pray around the world and is united in that practice, even when they're not seeing each other in person. So I hope that this sort of whets your um, appetite to interact with the architecture and ask it um, what thought is embedded in its structure and is it telling you about. And so um, I'd love to talk to you um, about this, uh, these examples and, 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 and specifically or, or this concept more broadly. Um, and um, I hope that you have a really wonderful time exploring this. Emily and Jeff, thank you so much. Um, I know that other people will have questions, um, <clears throat> but if we can start with, with Jeff, that was a 20 year process. Yes, uh, we didn't work for 20 years. We went in, did the finishes mm -hmm. analysis in 85, 86, um, and documented mm -hmm. all of the patterns and re revealed the original colors and did all the sampling then. And we created a report uh, and then, then we waited for 20 years, basically. We did some small little tiny projects, but it was interesting because so much had deteriorated over those 20 years until 2006. That report was all that was left to sh as a kind of a map to know what was originally there and how to restore it. So thank goodness we had that document mm -hmm. because that was the basis for putting it all back. And a lesson to maintain of whatever building you happen to own, <laughs> right? Yes. Right. Uh, well, the record is very important to have the archival records mm -hmm. and so that people know what was done, how it was done. And, and then, Emily, um, I always think when we're working on a, on a church or synagogue, and, you know, the synagogue has the names of former members. Uh, and then the churches have, of course, the, the stained glass windows dedicated to people. Um, I often think that everyone assumed that this was going to last, that they were, they were building for a longer time. And that in a, in a sense, whether you're religious or not, by maintaining the buildings, you're also kind of keeping their faith, you know, that the, they would be there, the city would be there, the building would be there. This, um, do you you get that sense of time and, and permanence? Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that it's an interesting thing because my work is in the restoration of, of religious buildings. Um, I end up having these kind of uh, philosophical uh, 
conversations about this with, with strangers. I wouldn't usually probably launch right into that, but when people ask me what I do, um, and I'm always amazed when people say like, you know, well, I don't usually, you know, attend church, but I'll always go into the building whenever I'm traveling. Or, you know, they'll talk to me about how important the church on their street is, even though they don't attend um, services. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when someone from a different faith rescues a building by, in, you know, in, um, by, uh, funding the, its its preservation, um, and we really do see how um, these buildings um, are about. They shape our our, our communities and in, in, in what they actually look like in that landscape. Landscape, but also they um, are these repositories. They tell these stories, um, and you know they help. You know what we do and don't do to them tell our story too. The architecture doesn't lie. You know. <laughs> Just anecdote there in Salt Lake City years ago we could we uh, restored the Cathedral of the Madalena Catholic Church in a Mormon city and everyone felt the importance of that building as part of the fabric the character the individuality of the city and so they mm -hmm. all shipped it wasn't just the Catholics who restored it, it was the Mormons who, who supported that as well so I thought that was a very mm -hmm. important uh, testimony to what Emily was just talking about I love that we in my church is uh, St. Augustine in Park Slope and when they were working on the um, the tower, um, the, the the rector there kept getting phone calls from people in the community saying, you know, what happened to the bells and, um, <laughs> and you know, you, you can't take down the tower, what's going to, and he, at first he was saying like, well, you don't come here, what does it matter to you? And they're like, oh no, this is very important to us. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. Right, and, and Jeff, you know, your premiere now, I mean, Evergreen is, is, is at the top. When you started, was there a roadmap for restorations like this or did you have to figure all this out as you went along? <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> you asked me what I'm doing in, in Italy. This is my graduate program here. I'm, I'm still learning. There's, you know, one lifetime is not enough to understand all there is to know about preserving buildings and what they mean. And I think also, so I've been at it for 43 years. There's been an evolution during that period of time of, of both, so in the 70s when I started, preservation wasn't a part of the consciousness of, the, of, of everyone. It was more, I don't wanna say an elitist activity, but it was, you know, certain people got it. And now everybody recognizes the importance of uh, sense of place uh, or, or much more so. So I think it's it's an evolving process, and as modern buildings become uh, um, worthy of preservation, you know, let's say 50 years on, there's a whole new technology involved. Uh, so it's constantly evolving and reevaluating uh, how why we value these buildings and and their importance and why they should be preserved. So I I don't know if that answered your question exactly, but yes, it's that it's changed a lot and. 43 years. Um, but just since you're, you're talking about Italy, um, just one other question about the, you have grounds and you have a chapel you're restoring there. Can I tell us? Yes, I, I do. <laughs> yes, my private project is restoring a chapel from the 1880s, 1890s. It's a, one individual's uh, little chapel, beautifully painted, uh, and I'm slowly restoring it. And so I, you know, that's, that's what I do in my spare time. If you haven't figured out the, what I do, it's, it's, it's my entire life. So, um, yeah, that's what I do here. <laughs> um, Emily, one of the things that we keep doing with Sacred Sites is, is encouraging uh, maintenance and helping people figure out how to break up projects and, and the importance of this. But um, given what we've been through, um, the past year and a half, and what we're still in. Um, are religious institutions continuing projects? Um, are you still, you know, busy? Yeah, we're very busy. Um, and I think a lot of institutions have taken the opportunity where, um, you know, when um, there are fewer, with, where there was no activity um, during the shutdown, we were quite busy. <laughs> and so, um, and I think that honestly, there's a great renewed um, interest in people really when they were deprived of, of, of attending mass and services in person, um, 
to know how really important that is. Um, and so, um, you know, to gather in, 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 the, in a place, in person with a community. Um, and so we really are certainly seeing that. And, you know, architecture is this kind of um, sculpture that you experience bodily, that you need mm -hmm. to walk through. And we can experience it in a certain way through photographs, but that, you know, it is a physical experience to walk through it. Um, mm -hmm. And has a profound impact on um, what you feel and how you experience um, the, the, the liturgy and the mm -hmm. and, and and so I think that um, that this uh, deprivation in this moment has really highlighted that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and Rick, we're not seeing these, but in a, in our prior tour, we saw uh, St. Joseph's Co Cathedral in Brooklyn, where you created um, all kinds of, of images. And um, I loved seeing a couple of years ago, the Baltimore Cathedral, where again, you, you were in there uh, painting. So it, it's hard to say, but what was the most challenging um, place that you've, you've had to deal with? Or the, your favorite, you know, something, what, it is, what really stands out? It's hard to pick a, a favorite because my head is always turned by the project that we're in. Um, you know, we, <laughs> <laughs> we um, we sink your teeth into something. I mean, the, the, the you know the the um, the challenges are different when you're um, when you're restoring something um, that has historic um, material that's that's uh, heavily compromised, um, where murals are really um, you know deteriorated. That's a different kind of um, of challenge. It's about the integrity of the of the of the original. Um, and um, and a technical challenge. Um, the other challenges um, at St. Joseph's, you know, you mentioned all the new artwork. Um, the challenge there is about creating um, new artwork that looks like it has always been there and integrating mm -hmm. that sort of seamlessly with the architecture and with the historic artwork. Um, and that is a project that's extremely dear to me. Um, and then. Um, and or projects where we've lost all the the artwork. I mean, um, Elder Street, where it's much of the historic was either deteriorated or covered, um, and so making those exposure windows and and unveiling what was it's hidden beneath. Um, uh, the uh, there's a there's a synagogue in I'm sorry there's a a church a seminary in um, uh, in Columbus Ohio the uh, the Josephinum where. Um, we were moving layers of this gray battleship gray paint and finding the face of Christ and all these angels beneath it. And, um, you know, that's thrilling. So, <laughs> But I have to agree with you. The project that's most important is always the one that we're working on now because that's where your attention is. Um, there are favorites. And, and I think as much as the, 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 the place, the people who are associated with it, I mean, there's so many factors that go into it, the, challenge, the technical challenges, but it's, I think your answer was right. It's, you know, what we're working on now is the most important project. I just um, put a comment in, um, in the chat that Emily's uh, talk is also encapsulated in an article she wrote for this year's issue of Common Bond. So I encourage everybody to check out our website and, uh, search for Common Bond, and uh, I, I put the link in the chat. But, um, she elaborates on, on today's talk in writing. And I would say, you know, one of the things that um, I, working recently on um, method, the Christ Methodist Church on Park Avenue, they leave their doors open uh, pretty much all the time during the day. And I really love mm -hmm. that people wander in and sit and, and pray and, um, and this is similar, Monsignor Harrington, at um, who the former um, pastor at uh, St. Joseph's in Brooklyn, you know, believed very strongly in leaving the doors open. And I think that um, I love that oh, the Sacred Sites program <laughs> encourages buildings, um, sacred buildings, to open their doors and, and invite people in. And I would encourage anyone listening to, you know, to <laughs> sometimes they're locked, often they're locked, but to go in and open doors and you know, not see if you can uh, walk into these buildings. Because I hear often people say things like, you know, well, I don't know if that's for me if I'm allowed to go in and, and it absolutely is I think <laughs> so if the if the doors are open go in and, and check them out I have to say that when I travel and I see a church upstate New York it could be walking on in, in Rome it could be in anywhere that I haven't I almost always knock on, I check the door if it's not uh, locked I go to the rectory and I knock on the door and I said hey I'm just passing through do you mind if I take a look and almost invariably they say sure come on you know we'll turn the lights on for you and you can see they said, for me, it's just an education, ongoing education to fill my brain with all these images, see how other people treat them, which ones have 
uh, special quality that uh, you know I, I look for. And, 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 and when you find it and you don't expect it, when you go to a place and there's a, a sort of aura or a, you know, it's a feeling, something like that, it's really remarkable that, I mean, a little, you know, people remark that Charlotte in, in Paris has that quality. Um, I've seen it in other uh, temples and, and tombs, the, the tomb of Nashkabundi outside of Bukhara in Uzbekistan mm. certainly has an amazing presence. And, mm. you know, those are experiences which come from someplace else. So mm -hmm. that is what's embedded in the stone. That is the spirit of the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I must say, whenever I see an open door of any kind of religious institution, I'll just zoom right in. I'll have to try knocking on, uh, on rectories and office doors, but um, I go in. And, it, and again, it doesn't matter if you are religious yourself to understand how special these buildings are. And given what we've all been through and are continuing to go through, you know, just that quiet space that takes you out of yourself and gives you a sense of perspective you know, that there's there's something larger than you and that, you know, life has been a continuum um, is, is enormously helpful. And so I really admire the institutions that do still keep, you know, keep the open door. Yeah, I love that. Um, that was uh, Monsignor Harrington saying like, you know, what's the worst that could happen if the door is something, you know, someone breaks something, we can fix that. But what's the worst that could happen if the door is closed and someone can't come in <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and have that experience? So and like what what inspired 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 you to write the the article and to think about how how architecture talks about being with you in spirit? Well, you know, I I, I believe strongly that um, you know the the church is, has been one of the greatest patrons of the arts ever, um, and that's not um, an accident. It's it's um, you know the. The art and architecture speak, and um, they are meant to communicate these really complex ideas. And um, you know, this coincided. When I was thinking about this talk and and um, that article with reading um, uh, the, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, where the cathedral is really a character in that story as much as any of the other people in the story. And I think um, that that is true. I mean, our homes, our um, our la our landscape, our architectural landscape. Um, uh, certainly the places we worship, certainly the places that, like we said, you know, if you don't go into them, they um, exert this sort of force in, in a city or in a town. Um, mm -hmm. and so um, this idea of what it is to be with someone in spirit, uh, it, it can kind of sound thin <laughs> because you're not going to be there. and We've kind of thrown it around a lot, but I think it has this great substance. I think it has um, not just substance, but form. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's terrific. If I might interject, when I lived in New York, I was a member of Christ Church Methodist. In fact, uh, was kind of the de facto archivist there. And uh, it's interesting, the open door policy, the, the, the ability to keep the door open, the cost of that was uh, the result of a donation by a neighbor who was Jewish and just felt the place was so beautiful it should be open to people who want to visit on the street. Yeah. And uh, I did tours there very frequently. And the first question that I would always get was, was this place always a Methodist church? And I'd put on an innocent face and say, well, yes, why, of course, do you, why do you ask? Because obviously it doesn't look like the austere uh, colonial chapel that people expect uh, with its richness. But it's interesting how the, how the artwork and the richness of the decoration transcends denominations and transcends the, the uh, polarization that we're dealing with right now. It's, it's a wonderful thing that Evergreen and, and these, uh, all of us together are trying to do. Oh, that, that, yes, that's terrific. And you know, and I Go ahead, Emily. Sorry. I was just going to say that I think that you know beauty is, has this job, um, it, which is to draw you in, um, and we see that certainly with you know um, a flower with a bee, <laughs> and we see that in um, you know with peacocks. We see that, we see you know how the, the 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 job of beauty is to attract, and so you know that's absolutely true of, of Christ Methodist and of all these buildings. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, well, since Jeff's in Europe, you know, um, it started with just raising a stone. You know, there was, I guess we've, we've always had a need to think of something larger than ourselves and have, have a particular place, whether it was a stone or within stones and then, and then you know, different buildings as they went along. Um, but I think that's, that's a, an innate need. And so when you hear sometimes that, well, you know, they've got a church or a synagogue or a mosque, there's all, the other, all these other things to do, there's a reason 
and a need why kind of universally we built special places for ourselves. Well, they are living buildings. I mean, they, <laughs> it, it, you hit the nail on the head. They, they are more than just stones. Uh, uh, you know, they represent something, whether we can read them or not, or whether we can feel them or sense them or have that experience. I mean, there is, we, you know, that I mean, it's a whole other subject about the iconography and what the, you know, the literal reading of buildings, you know, why, for instance, uh, churches across four, I'm just using a, you know, one example, but there's numerology and then in, in the, in the proportions. So there's any, all these different levels that you can read the building on, but fundamentally, as you said, they're, they're containers for both feelings, ideas, memories, and in that they live, you know, people participate in them and they have a life of their own that is actually more en enduring than the individual's life. So. And that goes to Peg's question earlier about the, those things, the people living on. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Well, listen, thank you so much. I thought this was fascinating. I hope everybody else enjoyed this um, as much as I have. I'm sure you have. And um, Emily and Jeff, you do wonderful work. We thank you for being part of the Conservancy family. And obviously, remarking on what you said earlier, Emily, I hope that next year we're all able to walk around again and actually experience um, all these wonderful buildings um, in person. But till then, this is a wonderful way uh, to see places and to hear wonderful things about them. So Jeff and Emily, thank you so much. Thank you all so much for joining us and um, hope we see you at another program.